So what did you find? What were the most common types of inner experience that people have? Well, I sometimes refer to what I call the five FP, or five frequent phenomena, which are inner speaking. People do talk to themselves sometimes. Inner seeing, most people call that seeing an image. I think there's a lot of reasons not to call it that, but people have visual imagery, and that's two. The third is sensory awareness. Sensory awareness is I'm interested in some particularly sensory aspect for its own sake. Like we're having this conversation and I could be drawn to the blue of a blue of your background, not because the, the blue is important to me or important to our conversation or relevant to our conversation, but for whatever reason, I'm interested in the blue of the of the background. That's sensory awareness from my point of view. Then the fourth is feelings. People do experience emotions from time to time. And the fifth I call unsymbolized thinking. And by unsymbolized thinking, I mean I experience myself to be thinking about something, and it's directly before the footlights of my consciousness thinking, but there's no words and no pictures and no imagery or, or whatever. So I could be thinking, well, I'm, let's go have a hamburger. No, I think I'll have a hot dog. Something that would be that explicit hamburgers, hot dogs, but without the words hamburger or hot dog and no picture of a hamburger and no smell of a hamburger and no anything about a hamburger, except that I recognize myself to be contradicting my original thought about a hamburger and changing my mind to a hot dog. And how common is the unsymbolized thinking? And is this different from person to person? All of the five, the five FP, all, all are common. And by common, I mean across all of my samples, they, they occur a quarter or a third or of the time. And you can have more than one at a time, so the numbers don't have to add up to one. But, but they're all common, and they're all, the frequency varies from zero to 100% within people. So people are hugely different. There are some people who, who do innerly speak almost all the time, and others who never innerly speak, and some who have visual imagery all the time, and some who never do, and all and everywhere in between. So people are, people are very different about that. This list of five frequent phenomena, this is not exhaustive, right? There are other phenomena that people experience? Absolutely. I don't want us to think that there's these five things that you can do, and and that's all, that's all you got. You're going to take this one off the shelf and do that, and then you're going to take inner speaking off the shelf and do that. That's not the way it is. What I think is that there are enough people who, who describe a phenomenon where they are engaged in some kind of speaking with themselves that we might as well give it a name and call it the same thing across people. And that would be in, inner speaking. But there's all kinds of variations, both within the five categories that I've ticked off there and, and others. So you can, inner speaking, for example, has as its neighbor's inner hearing. You can hear your own voice rather than speak it. And that that's a very different phenomenon, actually, as different as speaking into a tape recorder or hearing your voice come back out of a tape recorder. Same words, same voice, whatever, but the experience is dramatically different. And, and inner speaking takes place sometimes with entire sentences and sometimes with sort of a shorthand version of sentences. There are some theorists who think that all inner speaking is a condensed thing, but that's not true. It's actually it's actually more common from my point of view and more, more complete sentences than condensed. Mm. And sometimes words are present and sometimes they're missing and you can have the experience of speaking without any words at all or this all manner of of alternatives. And this question comes back to what you said about training people iteratively to do this, but I can imagine, it feels to me that with unsymbolized thinking, people would often feel like they need to describe that as inner speech. They might confuse those. Do you, do you see that happening? Let's say I'm imagining the hamburger and the hot dog, and you say, what were you thinking just then? And I might put it into speech, even if it wasn't actually how I experienced it. That's what generally happens. So the, the the typical pattern is that somebody says, I talk to myself all the time. And I and so I said, Well, that may very well be true, but let's let's discover that. So let the, and the first peep was I you, you would say, say, I was saying to myself, I should go have a hamburger. And I said, Well, what exactly were the words that you were saying? And you and you would say, 
I think I'd like to have a hamburger. And I would point out, well, those are not exactly the same words. The first set of words was, I should go get a hamburger. And the other one was, I would like to have a hamburger. Those are not exactly the same words. And I'm interested in words. So when you, if you have words, I'd like to know exactly what those words are. And you would say, oh, that seems fair. If he's, if I'm saying what the words are, I'll, I'll tell him then. And then the second day, you would come back and, and, and say, I was saying to myself that I should turn up the thermostat. And I would say, well, what are you saying to yourself? And you would say, well, the room was cold. And so I think I, I, was, uh, I was saying to myself that I should uh, put it up to 76 degrees. And I would say, well, you know, 76 degrees is a little bit different from I'm being cold. And what were those words? And then on the third day, you would come back and you'd say, you know, I've been telling you all these things about words, but they're not really words. But it takes the, it takes three days or four or five of careful interviewing before the typical person can say, well, you know, there really, really weren't words there. People have the notion, what I call the presupposition, that words are present. And and I would say that that my technique was never, well, I don't believe you when you say you had words there. Tell me about it. What I said instead was, you tell me what the words were. I like to know exactly what those words were. I was always in favor of your telling me about the words. You, because you're an honest broker, as most people really are down deep, would try to, would, would think of that as a reasonable question and try to do it. And they, you, would discover for yourself, no, there weren't really words there. So I'm, I feel like an innocent observer in that regard. I know some researchers are skeptical about the reliability of the reports of inner experiences. So how do you, how do you defend against that? So I think, I think everybody is, is justifiably skeptical about reports about inner experience. And I would say I think you should not think of the, re of the results of my studies as being reports of inner experience. They are descriptions of inner experience that have been generated by the participant and me together. That is not a report. It's a big difference from my point of view, because most of psychology is based on reports. We get a report from you and that's it. The subject is down the road and then we try to analyze this kind of a report. I think that's bad science. I don't do that. What I do instead is you give me a report that said, I was thinking that I should have a hamburger. And I said, well, let's flesh that out. Let's see whether we can get a description about that. It turns out to be a bad description. The second day, you'll give me another report. And I'll say, well, let's flesh that out. That turns out to be a bad description too. The third day, you give me another report. and But together, we can make that into a, a, a description that I think is believable. But it's a, it's a first-person plural exercise. It is not a first-person singular exercise. 